The following interview was conducted with our mechanical engineering alumnus, Edward A. Coleman, for the Purdue University Archives of Special Collections Oral History Program. Ed graduated from Purdue in 1975 and is one of the founders of the National Society of Black Engineers, also known as NSBE. His current role is serving as president and CEO of Bethel New Life. The interview took place on July 7th, 2018 in Oak Park, Illinois at the Oak Park Public Library. The interviewer is Tasha Zeffrin. Welcome, Ed. Good to be here. All right, so to begin, could you please tell me a little bit about yourself? So as you just stated, uh, I'm spending a lot of time, most of my day-to-day uh, -day time, including some weekends, working as the president and CEO of Bethel New Life. Uh, Bethel New Life is an organization I joined a little over six and a half years ago. Uh, that organization is charged with uh, really transforming the west side of Chicago and, and has been since it was formed in 1979. Uh, since I've come to Bethel, that focus has been economic transformation meaning it's, it's, uh, the mission of the organization is to take a look at where the west side of Chicago is economically, how the residents are dealing with the current economic conditions, and to provide people with opportunities to improve the economy on the west side collectively. So that's where I'm focusing my attention. In doing that, I'm able to leverage a lot of my experience and education uh, I've had years of, I'll just call it business experience, in the, uh, much of it in the Fortune 500 world, uh, working with AT&T and various, various offshoots of AT&T, whether they be subsidiaries or divested companies, uh, and did some, some of my own entrepreneurialism uh, for about five years, owned my own company. I helped a startup company get started in the telecommunications industry for about a year and a half, and then drifted into the nonprofit world about uh, oh, a little over seven years ago. And uh, I have found myself being really inspired by providing people opportunities in the nonprofit world. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I have been doing. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so where did you grow up? Grew up in, in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, one of the other founders of NSBE, George Smith, and I met each other while, while uh, we were in sixth grade at, at Fernwood Elementary High School. I, I grew up, spent most, most of my youthful time on 97th and Low on the far south side. I, I don't know what they call that area nowadays. I think Washington Heights or something like that. Uh, so I grew up there. Uh, I was one of five kids. I was the oldest of five kids. Uh, uh, went to Fernwood Elementary School, uh, did a lot athletically, at least as a youngster, played baseball, started to play basketball, uh, played Little League Baseball, really in, in Jackie Robinson, before there was a Jackie Robinson West, which you may have heard of. There was a Jackie Robinson, and, and uh, Jackie Robinson League. And so I, I was part of that Jackie Robinson League. I played on the Dodgers at the time, if anybody wants to check their records. I'm not sure they even had those records. Uh, but, yeah, so I, I was active. Uh, I was active. I tried to be well-rounded. Uh, while in elementary school, I found myself uh, not only with the ability to engage in mathematical activities, but really kind of a passion to understand as much about math as possible. So that kind of triggered me toward uh, the engineering uh, arena a little bit. And then even more so after I got in high school. I went to Morgan Park High School. I was, one of the, I was the only founder of the six founders that went to Morgan Park High School. The other five went to Lindblom High School. So uh, I went to Morgan Park High School, which is about as far, as, you can, as far south as you can be in the city and still be in the city. Um, and so uh, while at Morgan Park High School, I got a decent uh, education and exposure to all kinds of things, and it even more solidified my desire 
to get into engineering uh, as a potential career area. And so while at Morgan Park, I took a number of physics classes, two physics classes, a chemistry class, uh, multiple mathematical classes, and I really honed my uh, combined science and mathematical capabilities and put myself in a position where I could probably get into most colleges that offered engineering just based on what I was capable of, capable of and the SAT scores and so forth that I was getting. So I felt pretty good about being able to do that. Uh, I didn't know at the time that, but being able to do that after going to a Chicago public school school is very unique. And so, I, I, uh, I, I as I look back at it, I'm almost amazed that I was able to accomplish what I, I was able to do. And I'm not I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that was amazing an amazing thing mm -hmm. that I I was able to accomplish. And so that passion for math that you mentioned, mm -hmm. like from elementary school, mm -hmm. was it? Mm -hmm. How did that? Does it just I always had it? It, it was it was it was almost like, boy, uh, there's nothing I can't figure out. I should okay. be able to figure this out. And if it turned out I couldn't figure it out at first glance, I would just stay. I'd be, I'd be resilient. I'd just stick with it until I was able to figure it out. So it was, in my early days, it was something as simple as long division and so forth. And then as things uh, went went up along, I started to figure out things like uh, variable equations and, and so forth and started to dig into, even in high school, even though calculus was not offered when I was in high school, I was starting to dig into calculus a little bit just to figure out what it was all about. And so it's, it's just like, here's a challenge. I'm not going to get put down by this challenge. I'm going to rise to the challenge, and rise to the situation, and math was the perfect uh, example of how I could do that. Okay. So, are you the only engineer in your family? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I really am. Yeah. So, did you get interested in engineering um, through the high school courses, or how did that interest come about specifically? I, I had been exposed to some degree uh, in various forms to what some of the things engineers could do. I'll give you an example. Um, the old TV show. Mission Impossible, which you probably can't relate to because you weren't born at the time, probably. Uh, I saw the recent movie in that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure. But the TV show had uh, a black engineer. The, the guy who was the, the technical expert happened to be an African-American guy. Uh, I think his character was called Barney or something. It was Greg Morris was the actor. Okay. And so I was inspired to a considerable degree I love that TV show. I just love the show because of all the things they went through. There's always drama. Are they going to get caught? They never got caught, by the way. But there was always drama associated with, uh, with the things they did. And Barney was the smartest guy on the show because he figured out all these technology things that needed to happen in order for the Mission Impossible missions to be successful. So uh, I looked at that was one of the inspirations for me to say hey this is what I can do with this with this knowledge and and there were others but but that was that was part of the trigger for me that was the main one <laughs> uh, that was one of the main ones okay. i'd say yeah what's another main one oh what's another main one um, so i was into science fiction i, I like the original star trek tv show with spock and spock impressed me by the things he'd be able to just rattle off that were in a matter of fact way you know, warp speed. If we go, if we hit warp speed, we'll be able to cover this many light years in in a, in a few hours, and, and that type of thing. And I was always fascinated by that. And then I did a lot of, I did some reading, and so was aware of. Uh, I, I was interested in other elements of science just beyond just basic engineering, such as astronomy. And so I focused a lot on things like the distance between stars and parsecs and and all that stuff. And and there was a relationship between that and engineering to some degree. So I, all those things were were various inspirations for me to get into the engineering field. I wasn't sure then if mechanical engineering was the right engineering field, but I knew engineering of some type was it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at Purdue specifically? 
And at Purdue specifically is, is where I was able to nail it down to mechanical engineering. Okay. Uh, but did you, sorry, it was uh, more of asking. Oh, why, why, did yeah, why did I go to Purdue? Why did I go to Purdue? I had I'd applied to various other colleges, but I kind of knew, I kind of liked Purdue from what I had heard about Purdue and studied, studied about Purdue uh, for a while. Purdue was probably the preeminent engineering school in the Midwest in general. And if I didn't want to travel a thousand miles or more to get to where I was going, Purdue was probably the perfect selection. Uh, and there were other things about Purdue that I liked, like it was located in a in a small to mid mid sized town, Lafayette, Indiana, West Lafayette, Indiana. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was away from the big city, and I wanted to get away from Chicago. I just wanted to be at a distance from Chicago. Uh, uh, it was it was not fast moving, which was okay for me at the time. I didn't need to be in a at a party school, mm-hmm. uh, and. Uh, and it, it had other things associated with it that I just felt were comfort, comforting. Uh, and I think after, after being accepted by Purdue and then my first visit to Purdue, which was really the summer before school started, I felt more and more comforted by the school. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Art Bond, or Dr. Bond, you may, you, I know George and, and Brian have probably talked about him a little bit. Uh, Art was really one of the first people I met during my summer visit to Purdue, and he was helpful in reassuring me that uh, he would be supportive of what I was trying to accomplish while at Purdue. And I'll talk a lot more about Art, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so that was that was helpful. To what extent did others, like in your family or neighborhood growing up, kind of help support your uh, they, to go to college? They all reinforced, my parents in particular, reinforced my my uh, study choice, which was engineering, and they reinforced Purdue as the place to do it. Uh, I had other members, like extended family members, uncles and aunts, and those kinds of people that were more than encouraging on, on the path that I was taking, of the path that I was taking. So... My younger brothers and sisters did, had no knowledge of what that was going to mean, so they, you know, they, they. I don't want to say they were insignificant, but they just had no knowledge of of what it meant to to pursue what I was pursuing. But but the other the other family members they were very supportive, and and said, yeah, you're going you're going in the right direction. So so I did. What's now, the gap have, between you and your siblings? You so I got a brother who's two and a half years younger than me. So he's actually three years younger from a, uh, you know, in terms of his, his grades, mm-hmm. what grade he was in and all that. I got another brother who's, who's four years younger than me, so, so that type of thing. Uh, so they wouldn't, they just wouldn't have the wherewithal, at, would not have had the wherewithal at that time to really understand where I was going with this. So, but my, my other older relatives, including uncles, aunts, and, and mother and father, and actually, my grandfather. Don't want to leave him out. He was very supportive. I had a, my mother's father was very supportive of the career choice I made. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, the study choice. I made. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. So you end up at Purdue. Mm-hmm. You're a first year engineering student. Mm-hmm. What was the environment at Purdue like? So I, the first dorm I stayed in was this place called Cary Quadrangle. I believe George would tell you that he 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 stayed there also. I think Brian may have also. We, we I didn't know Brian when I came to Purdue. I did know George, uh, uh, but and I'm not sure who was whose roommate at the time. I had a roommate who I didn't know. Uh, Query Quadrangle was a very old dormitory. Almost looked like uh, it was built up like a castle, kind of. Uh, so it was one of the older dormitories without a lot of modern conveniences, uh, but it was very traditional. So I got to Purdue, moved into the dorm, got accustomed to my roommate, and then started trying to figure out how to be a college student. Uh, but I also, because it was really my first time of being independent from my family, there are probably some things that uh, I experimented with that were along the lines of nobody's controlling me, let's see what happens, <laughs> if you know what I mean. That, and, and I know it's the kind of thing that a lot of kids will tend to do once they get away from home and go to college. 
uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but there was some, I actually found myself uh, with a little bit of an illness that, that may have, if I wasn't careful, kept me from going to class. And in fact, it did keep me from going to class for a couple of weeks, which I'm sure impacted my overall performance in my first semester of my freshman year and and made me decide no more of that kind of stuff let's buckle down and I did mm -hmm. and and I think I started in the second semester of my freshman year, year really accomplishing the kinds of things I felt I really needed to accomplish at Purdue as a student uh, and so uh, and I learned from, I learned from that and picked up some study habits and some study, some study skills that would carry me forward for the rest of my, my college career. How did you pick up those study skills? Um, uh, it's a matter of being determined, a matter of, and it wasn't anything that was rocket science, it's a matter of, of being disciplined. Examples being don't wait till till Friday or Sunday. Don't wait till Sunday at 6 o'clock in the evening to study this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Come home from class, come, come to my dorm room, study this stuff immediately that you went over today. Do the homework you got to do if you got homework. Get it done so it's solid in your mind so that, so that uh, you're not trying to cram all the time. Uh, you're learning versus cramming. You know that kind of stuff, and 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 I found that to be productive, productive use of my my ability to be a reasonable student. And there are, there are probably other things. You know, in some cases, uh, there's some collaborating I may have done with some other people, like Tony Harris, who's a name you probably know or are familiar with. He and I were both mechanical engineering, and so we took some class, some of the same classes, and so there was some collabor collaborative studying. That the two of us may have done in, in, in certain things, you know. So that was also helpful. And what was the social environment at Purdue like? So you mentioned living in the dorms, but what, what other things were going on? Uh, Purdue was not the ultimate party school. There were there were parties. Yeah, there are probably parties now. If you're at Purdue today, there probably are uh, parties. Really, that were black community focused. A lot of them were put on, were organized by fraternities and sororities, the popular fraternities and sororities. I, it didn't take me long to figure out I did not necessarily need to be part of a fraternity. Uh, I, I did participate in other organizations at the time, uh, but I, I did on occasion, like I won't say every week or every weekend, but on occasion, if, if one of those organizations was putting on something, I might attend it. Uh, I, in my freshman year, probably played too much basketball, but I, I, I did own my basketball skills at, at the Colrec. I don't know if they still call it that, that. And so I was at the Colrec multiple times a week in my freshman year. Probably one of the, and this is not bragging, and it may sound like it, one of the best basketball players not to be on the Purdue basketball team. That's how, how well I thought I honed my skills at, at the Colrec. Uh, and I probably went there too much, which was probably, probably contributed to my somewhat lack of discipline in my first semester of my freshman year. I eased up, eased up on that in my second semester uh, as, as I was becoming a better student. Smart decision. Uh, and so, but but in terms of my social stuff, that's the kind of thing I did. Um, I partied a little bit, went to the co rec a lot. Okay. okay. And was that environment pretty segregated? So were you hanging out mainly with black students? At the co rec, uh, no, it was it was an integrated environment. Okay. Uh, there there were black students that went to the co rec, but it was by far a lower percentage of black students than 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 white students. At the Corrette, uh, the, the partying I did was was African American. It was it's black centric, so yeah. Okay. So that's kind of. I also there was a, a 
prior to the current Black Cultural Center, there was another Black Cultural Center, the original Black Cultural Center, uh, which was a converted house on whatever street that is, uh, the street outside the music, Hall of Music. I can't think of the name of the street, but there was a converted house that was a Black Cultural Center, and I spent some time there. We had so, and I, we were, I know we're going to get to this, the founding of the Society of Black Engineers, but we had uh, some of our SBE meeting or BSE, we called it BSE at the time, Black Society of Engineers. We had some of the meetings at, at the Black Cultural Center, but there were, there were other things going on like bid whisk games and that type of thing. I probably became a real, uh, I'll just say, a very skilled bid whisk player in my freshman year at Purdue. Uh, I still have, I still, whenever I have the opportunity, hone my bid with skills, but uh, I think at, it was there at Purdue that in my freshman year at the Black Cultural Center that I believe I, I, uh, I got reasonably good at, at that. And that was the other social thing I, I guess I can say I did. Uh, but, but for the most part, if you ignore, if you, not you can't ignore those because those were there, but it was being a student for the most part that was the real focus. Mm -hmm. And then what was it like from a more academic perspective, so being the engineering classes? So, um, so the engineering classes, the, it, as a freshman, they're like preparatory classes. So it's math, chemistry, entry physics, it really, I think it was two two physics classes, two chemistry classes. Those classes, I wasn't put off by at all. I I, I think they they were good fundamental classes. Uh, uh, most of them, I think I was prepared for most of them as a result of my high school experience, where I didn't find them overly challenging at all. Um, uh, there are other classes that they make you take, some English, and speech, and all that stuff, that were fundamental. That I was, you know, I just did them. Uh, one of the things I do remember is that they kind of forced me to have a minor, a minor, uh, to focus on, in terms of a group of classes that were not necessarily directly related to engineering. And I decided that philosophy would be my minor. And so I took, took one class in basic philosophy and then two classes in logic, which were the kind of advanced philosophy. Uh, and those were really interesting. I did very well in, in, in those classes uh, to the point where probably if I wanted to, I could have evolved into that type of thing if there was some commercial benefit to it which I really didn't see. So, so uh, uh, but the preparatory classes were fine, and it gave me enough information to know that mechanical engineering of all the various engineering disciplines should be where I'm going. Uh, if I think about the physics classes I took, the fact that I could relate to a lot of that stuff. Uh, if you think about motion and physical science, of all the engineering disciplines that deal with motion and physical science, mechanical engineering was probably the most relevant. And so that's that kind of drove me in that direction because that's what I had an appreciation for. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it does. All right. <laughs> well, you got me so, going back a lot of years, though. <laughs> think about think about what time frame we're talking about. I'm talking 1972, 1970. Yeah. I mean, those... So that goes back a while. And right you said, so you lived in the dorms? I lived in it the whole there? time there. I, I lived in the dorms. I started off at Cary Quadrangle my freshman year and went to Tarkington Hall for the rest of my time. Okay. Uh, sophomore, junior, senior, I was at Tarkington Hall. I actually was Brian's roommate one of those years. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another gentleman who's passed away, John Logan, who I was a roommate of with for a while. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What was part of the reason you decided to stay on campus? Because I know some of the others moved off at some point. My parents strongly encouraged me. They they didn't want my parents didn't want me living off campus. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they thought I'd do. Uh, I actually met the person who would be my wife as a sophomore, uh, in, well into my sophomore year, uh, and 
and she lived off campus for a while, and I spent some time with her, but she didn't move off campus until her junior year, uh, until my junior year. And so she lived way off campus, so I'd visit her every once in a while, but I decided to stay on campus. Uh, it, it was smart, and my parents encouraged me to do that, but it was helpful in terms of uh, avoiding distractions from studying, let other people prepare food. You know, the, the dorms would prepare the food at the time. and I let them do that. I was happy with that. Uh, when, when John Logan and I were roommates, every once in a while we'd do something special for ourselves, like he had this uh, electric pan and we'd make sirloin steaks and that type of thing. <laughs> I remember that clearly. But, but for the most part, uh, the campus had a lot of benefits, including getting to class. They weren't, the, the, the dorms were not that far from the engineering classes, Sparkerton Hall in particular. Mm -hmm. So I could, I could walk three blocks and get to class in most cases, mm -hmm. maybe a half mile the most. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was beneficial. And so I'm sure like every engineering student faces some kind of challenge moving into Purdue no matter what. But as a black engineering student, do you think you had any additional challenges? Uh, so as a black engineering student, part of the benefit of having attended Morgan Park High School was that that was an integrated environment to a considerable degree. degree. Uh, at that time, probably more than 50% white. And so being in an integrated environment was not shocking to me, even though Purdue was much more overwhelmingly white than 50%. Uh, the fact that I had been exposed to people of, of other races and cultures was helpful to me in terms of being inter integrated into that environment. Uh, my roommate, as a freshman, was a white person. Um, now, as a black engineer, one of the things that I wasn't as aware of, but it was definitely the case, that I, na I almost, I naturally did not have the support base that other students may have had. In other words, because I was black, I'm not sure I was able to tap into all the supports that some of the other students would have had at that time. Uh, I didn't realize that as much as a freshman as I did as I went as I went along. Part of the reason for the founding of the Society of Black Engineers, the Black Society of Engineers, was the fact that, uh, and I wasn't focused on that, but apparently the dropout rate of engineers was way up there, like eighty percent somewhere somewhere in that ballpark, uh, and. And so Art Bond, who I mentioned, and I'll mention again, uh, was supportive of the things that we know we needed to do, including the founding of, of uh, the Black Society of Engineers, which was founded really for the purpose of, of lowering that dropout rate and helping students successfully complete the program. So that was a good... Um, that was a good group for not only camaraderie, but, but for mutual support. Because mm -hmm. we all were kind of in a similar boat or the same boat in terms of, of uh, the kinds of challenges that we were facing and, and tapping into some people who may be going through the same thing or may have gone through the same thing was very helpful. Mm -hmm. without, without BSE at that time, uh, I probably would have succeeded but the challenges would have been even bigger. Mm. So how did you first get involved with BSC? So, so I think I told you I knew George. I met George in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, as a freshman, uh, George and I would see each other all the time, you know, at the coal wreck or, or elsewhere, uh, maybe even in a class. Uh, Stan Kirtley, who's also passed away, uh, I know was in a number of classes with me, I think as a freshman. And so we talk, and we would talk about things. And there was a, there was a gentleman by the name of Ed Barnett, who I was a senior when we were freshmen, getting ready to graduate. And Ed really was instrumental in the 
founding of the Black Society of Engineers and then communicating to us. Some of it was through Art Bond, some of it was through other sources, but communicating through to us the fact that this organization was being established for the purpose of supporting, providing mutual support. Mm -hmm. So I think it may have been October or November that I went to the first Black Society of Engineers meeting. And I said, hey, then, you know, this is good. I, I need to keep doing this. this is, there's some benefits associated with this. So that's how it really got started for me. Mm -hmm. What happened at that first meeting? Oh, now you're testing me. Uh, so you're, you're going back to 71. This is 2018. So you're talking 47 years, almost 47 years ago. I think it was basically a discussion of why this organization would be beneficial to us. I don't think there was any technical information exchange at the meeting or anything like that. I think it was a matter of, of, of discussion that says this is good stuff. This is a good organization. This will be beneficial to all participants. Uh, you can't go wrong as a result of participating. So that's, that was pretty much it, I think. Yeah. Again, you're going back 47 years. <laughs> I didn't have a tape recorder going in, and I'm not even sure I took good notes, so I, I was just there. Yeah. Whatever you remember now is the essence. Yeah, that's it. The important essence. Well, I, I know. So I'll tell you this. Ed Barnett was, was a key behind that discussion. He was, he was the main communicator of, of all, all of what we talked about, which is the benefits of the organization. There are a few other people who were senior, who were upperclassmen who uh, relayed similar information. Um, I don't know if he was a junior or a sophomore, but there's gen another gentleman by the name of Fred Cooper who would eventually uh, become the president of the Purdue Society, Society of Black Engineers. Uh, Fred was also a football player, but he was, so he was the rare guy who was a football player at the, at the collegiate level, uh, interscholastic athlete and an engineering student. So Fred was also uh, good at, at, at uh, inspiring us to participate in this organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are a few others. I'm, I'm naming those two. <laughs> there are a few others. So during those um, initial years with Ed and Fred kind of leading mm. the charge, what was the goal of the chapter? To keep people from dropping out of the engineering, keep African Americans from dropping out of the engineering curriculum to provide the support necessary to help students be successful. That was really the primary focus. Okay. So that was done via primarily communication. People talking to each other about what, what challenges they might have. I remember spending a lot of time talking to people, talking with people like George Smith and John Logan and Brian Harris and, and Anthony, Anthony Harris and Stan Kirtley. I mean, those people, those are the folks who were in the, some of the similar classes I was in. So, so we spent a lot, I remember being in a, in a statics class. What is statics? Statics is still motion, is advanced physics, mm -hmm. uh, things they don't, that don't move. There was a dynamics class that was taught by the same professor of, of, the way forces and acceleration act on things that do move. Uh, but I remember statics, and, and uh, Anthony Harris and, and Stan Kirtley and I were all in that same class. And I remember some of the uh, interesting challenges. And I found that class, to be honest, I found that class to be easily understandable. And But I found that I was also rare because some of the other people didn't find it that easily understandable. So I took those classes. I know I took some air conditioning uh, classes uh, with Tony Harris and, and so forth, and we gave each other a lot of mutual support in terms of completing that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, we took some of us, some of the benefit of, NF, of SBE, and we talked to each other anyway, but some of it was, let's get in the same class. You talk to each other about what classes are coming up the next semester, and maybe we should all be in the same be on the same schedule and be in the same class. And we did some of that. Mm -hmm. So th those are all beneficial things. Yeah. Okay. So did participation in 
BSC to SBE, you know, the mm -hmm. name changed as it mm -hmm. went along. Mm -hmm. um, did it help you get more involved at Purdue? I'd say to some degree, I actually, so as an, a mechanical engineering student, I joined the American Society uh, of, I'm sorry, yeah, American Society of Mechanical Engineers Purdue chapter, mm -hmm. and actually became an officer, vice president of something in that chapter. Uh, Tony was also in that chapter, Tony Harris. I think he became president of the chapter. Um, and so that's other Purdue involvement. Um, uh, and I thought we were instrumental. I remember Tony and I both taking trips across the country, like Madison, Wisconsin, which isn't that far, but I think we also went to New York City uh, for ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, representing Purdue, and participating in those activities expired us to some degree to say, why not take SBE and drive that into a national organization? So that was, so yeah, I mean, the, participating in other organizations, there was kind of a chain reaction effect that said, let's do this, and then let's do this, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So those are all those are all things that that were, and and what else did I do at Purdue? Uh, I I I'm sure a lot of other stuff I can't remember it all, uh, but some of it was stimulated by SBE. Yeah, some of it was. I mean, SBE as an SBE, we were. I remember doing things like they had these. Uh, it wasn't go kart, but these things you had to build a, build a vehicle. A little cart. It was like a like a mini mini go kart. Mm -hmm. That uh, and and so they had these contests, and I remember SBE putting a car together for that purpose. So it was things like that. They still do the go kart today. They do. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't know that, but I, I, I learned something. Learned something. I don't know what I, what they do today, to be honest with you. But, but that's great. Yeah, that's what it was. It was a Grand Purdue Grand Prix. They still, so traditions, some traditions don't stop. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Right, so how would you say the um, Black Society of Engineers chapter hmm. helped you in your pursuit of an engineering degree? So knowing that, that uh, there were others going through what I was going through was always inspirational. I don't think I ever felt that I wanted to give up on it. I, I think that I was, no matter what, I was going to get that degree. I'd let myself down, I'd let my family down, I'd let everybody down if I didn't get that degree. And and not only that, I felt that, that a lot of what my thoughts were with respect to my future career planning hinged very definitely on getting that degree. Uh, SBE was a vital tool in achieving that. As the years went along, um, I was doing things like, like, I think we had a tutorial assistance committee that I was in charge of, and so much of that mutual support I was coordinating uh, with, like, as I became a junior, as an example. Mm -hmm. And freshmen would come in and they were trying to figure out how, how to get help with their math or their physics or whatever. I was coordinating a lot of that support. If I couldn't provide it to them directly, I'd send them in a direction where they could get some support, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So SBE became more of, became over time a trusted organization that would reinforce uh, for a lot of the students their ability to complete the program. Um, it wasn't perfect. It didn't accomplish that in all cases, but it did in many cases. For me personally, uh, SBE was kind of the infrastructure, but it was the support that really us founders gave each other that probably would have happened with or without SBE because we knew each other. But the, fa the fact that we were giving each other support in our academic endeavors with SBE as an infrastructure, uh, I think that was helpful, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, why did you use the term trusted organization? 
because okay, so so maybe I'm I'm going back to what I do as, in my nonprofit. In some environments, trust is not an everyday experience. Trust, trust, and, and I'd say I'm going back to my nonprofit. With what I do at Bethel New Life, mm -hmm. I deal with people who come from an environment where people don't naturally trust each other. They don't, in, in general. The west side of Chicago, people don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. In general, that's just the fact of life. And, and, and it manifests itself in things like street violence. And, and you know, that takes it to an extreme, but that's a good way to, to describe it. So, so at Purdue, at Purdue, where many of us did not come from environments where we, you know, did not come from integrated environments, and you had people of various races, creeds, and colors, people from the African American community who were working in on engineering degrees, SBE offered a an environment that said. We're here to help. Uh, we're going to show you why you should put trust in us. You know, once you experience that, you'll keep you'll keep coming back to that. And not only that, you will be in a position to help other people. So, so there was an aura of getting people involved where they could build that trust and 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 get and and experience that as they were going through that program. Here we are in SBE. To provide you with what you're going to need to be successful, uh, and over time we do things like, like build test files and, and things like that that would be helpful. Test files and courses that people took all the time, like the advanced math and the physics and and, and things like that. So so and we were a source. We became a source of trust uh, that that would assist people in their academic achievements. Was that something you wouldn't necessarily find in ASME, for example? Uh, it, yeah, it wasn't part of ASME. It was never even talked about in ASME. ASME talked about things like uh, 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 programs like, I don't know, uh, papers that people would, would present and, and, and that type of thing. ASME, ASME was not a, an organization that had mutual support as its mission. I don't think I, I as I as I look back on it, that's not why ASME existed, but it was why NSBE. Or sorry, why SBE yeah. <laughs> existed. That is why it existed. Mm -hmm. We want to all be successful. Okay. And were so. they and other any other people or groups that helped you persist at Purdue? Individuals more so than more more so than groups. There were people who we came to find even even I mean non African American people in some cases became trusted uh, members of of teams that I would participate on in order to to achieve my success. I remember sitting down and talking with things talking about certain subjects in certain classes with a number of non African American people. These were students, or students, faculty? students. Okay. Uh, for the most part, students. Where we could we can talk about certain things that that um, would 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 get us help us achieve. Uh, uh, faculty uh, to some degree, but and, and some faculty was more open to that than others. Um, it was mostly students. And it's just my experience. I saw there were other students who I would be able to to communicate with in a trusting manner. Uh, and as I think about it, I probably didn't know what to call it then, but it was more. It was probably a little bit of uh, non-inclusiveness. As part of the mindset of some of the people that existed at Purdue, so I, I probably was able to categorize it's easier to deal with this person than it is with this person, okay. because this person I have more trust in, and this person is more open to to communicating with me than this person who may not want to communicate with me because of, of what I look like or whatever, and and so I know that existed at Purdue. 
I probably didn't give that any thought because it was part of the natural environment. But I'm sure, because I learned a lot about human life, I learned a lot about life and reflected a lot about life long after I got out of Purdue. And I tended, tended to look back at things and say, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but there was probably some non-inclusiveness going on. I'll, I'll use the term, I use the term uh, prejudicial exclusiveness going on. Ex- presidential excluding, prejudicial excluding going on. Uh, that I may not have considered it at the time, but looking back at it, that there probably was. You know, I think that was part of part of life back then, and I, I was probably too naive to understand it. If you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And so you mentioned um, that participating in the national conferences for ASME was part of the sort of thought child. Th- for, for me it was. Now, you, you might get a, a debate from, a, from George or Brian. If you talk to Tony, he'd probably resonate with, uh, with what I'm saying because mm-hmm. he and I participated in some of the same conferences. And, and I know Tony, Tony expressed out loud, if they could do it, why not us? In other words, he was the president of the, of the ASME chapter at Purdue, so he saw, and I was a vice president, so we both saw it up front and, and close and personal. And it was a few, you know, probably not less than a month before I graduated, where we had our first NSBE conference at Purdue. But there were a lot, there was a lot of legwork that went into that, and some of it was based on some of the things that both he and I saw at the ASME uh, activities. So what did it take to pull off that first conference? So that was, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be very frank. I, I was going on a lot of job interviews, personally, mm-hmm. uh, and trying to graduate, right? So this is my, my last semester at Purdue. We thought about, we, we agreed to do it uh, first semester, my senior year. We agreed we're going to try to make this conference happen. And so, so what it took was a lot of communicating, and I, I would be the first to say, because of where I was in my, in my trying to graduate, I had some communication with Art Bond, but much of it was, was people talking to the president, of, uh, 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 President Hansen at Purdue, and I know Tony went through Art Bond, Tony went through Art Bond, I think for the most part, to get President Hansen to agree to have the conference at Purdue University. Then we had to invite then as a result of that agreement, we invited multiple people from multiple other you know, universities and colleges to come to our conference. And so that's what happened. Um, uh, I'm sorry, most of the schools that, many of the schools we invited actually said, this is a good idea, and so let's do this. And so we weren't sure what was gonna come out of the conference, but we put together an agenda that, that talked about things like, this is what we want to accomplish as a national organization. It's pretty much evolving the Purdue SBE chapter to an N- uh, charter to an NSBE charter uh, in terms of you know mutual support is what it's going to take to get people to graduate. So maybe what you should do on your campus is comparable to what we've done here at Purdue in terms of establishing those mutual support structures and all that kind of stuff. So all that was a key element of, of that, but it was inspiring people to understand at other schools, inspiring them to understand the benefits of a national organization mm-hmm. so that they would show up at the first conference. Mm-hmm. How, did, how did you, or how did the group, because I guess there's so many different people working on this, right. get that inspiration to come across to convince people to actually come? Well, we wrote letters for the most part. Uh, I mean, you think about it, you're going back to 1975. We didn't have email. There's no such thing as email back then, believe it or not, in 1975. Uh, so the primary communication was telephone and letters, and it was mostly letters uh, to the deans of engineering at the various universities, uh, MIT, Caltech, everybody else, the various universities that had well-recognized engineering programs, even Notre Dame, which was theoretically uh, down the street, but uh, Few, couple of, a mile, a hundred miles away, just getting getting them to agree 
that an organization like this would be of benefit. Part of the part of the inspiration was if you're suffering, if you school, your school is suffering from a major attrition problem among its black engineering students. This is a way that we think could be helpful in solving that problem. So that was kind of the compelling argument that said this is worth participating in just because this may be very helpful for dealing with that, if you know what I mean. Right. And so that was that was a high level, uh, that was an element, high level element of the invitation. We'll talk about this stuff when you get here, mm -hmm. but you gotta be here in order for us to deal with it, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. And you were able to attend the first conference. I was able to spend time. <laughs> I, I, not again. I was, and it was, it was, it was the timing was horrible, because I was graduating in about three weeks, I think roughly three weeks, and I was still doing some job interviewing, and so, so, but I was able to spend enough time to to uh, to interact with people, and so forth. Okay, so from that glimpse, mm -hmm. what was that experience like for you or for others from your perspective? Uh, that we are accomplishing something that that is of value, probably to a lot more people than we could have dreamed of, uh, and that we're, we're off to a good start with this. I wasn't sure where, you know, where it was going to end up, but at least we had momentum building that said, in so many words, what we've done at Purdue is acceptable for other students other engineering students at other locations. It's acceptable, it's a good model, other people want to leverage that model and, and do something with it. So, I mean, that was, that was kind of my, my observation, mm -hmm. you know. Did you have a sense of what some of the other students who are um, traveling to Purdue and Indiana kind of thought about that experience? Because from what I know about just I don't know, the context of things at the time, like I drive to Indiana now and see like cornfields everywhere. <laughs> And what does that mean? <laughs> kind of so, like so, 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 I, I, I hadn't thought about it from that perspective, I guess. But, but since you bring it up, so, so you're right. When you get to, going to West Lafayette, West Lafayette is not an urban center. Uh, it's a city, but it's it's a city surrounded by cornfields, like you say, and that type of thing. So to get the West Lafayette from Notre Dame. Uh, the hundred miles or whatever it is to get there. Um, I think I think for the most part, uh, West Lafayette is probably the epitome of a college campus because it is isolated. Because it's isolated from from the city and other other urban facilities and, and other universities. So it, because of that, I think there were, the setting of the first conference may have been somewhat perfect. In other words, they don't have to worry about other distractions. We're here to deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. This is what we're here for. Why would you, you know, why else would you come here? Uh, so, so that was kind of, kind of it. The, the more I think about it, I think that was, that was mo and I didn't, I've never really asked these other people who participated, what did you think about coming to Purdue? You know, I, uh, it was at Purdue. You're the organizing, you know, entity for this thing. That's where we're going to have it. So, because mm -hmm. another element too, mm -hmm. when I think about it, just from my disjointed knowledge, of mm -hmm. one of the first things I associate with Indiana is KKK. And how does that so, unfortunate? I don't know what it's like today. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it's like. I don't know how 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 preeminent the KKK is around Lafayette. Today, in, in uh, 2018, I know that was always talked about in 1973, 4, or 5. It was talked about. Uh, I never had any personal experiences that had me face-to-face -face with the KKK in any way, shape, or form, as far as I know. I may have, but as far as I know, I didn't. Uh, so uh, I don't know how much of an issue that may have been in terms of det deterring participating participation in the first conference. I didn't think about it at the time as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. 
I think most people who wanted to come to the conference came to the conference regardless of what their image of, of Indiana was uh, because they, they understood the benefits, for the most part, of what we were trying to accomplish. So I don't think that, that I don't think, and, and someone may say they didn't come because of that, but I, I don't know of anybody who didn't. It's my view. Yep. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, for those who may not be aware, mm -hmm. the current mission of NSBE is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. Mm -hmm. So what's your, pers your perspective on the mission that has evolved from the organization since that first conference? So, so the mission is, has always been, the mission has always been, I think, an impactful mission. I think achieving, so in order to, so, so you have a vision that goes along with a mission, as, as I know, as I run a nonprofit. And the vision is, what do you expect the environment to look like if, if, if you successfully achieve this mission. I don't think we've accomplished that vision yet. Uh, part of the vision, part of the vision that I would expect, you know, part of, part of the reality that I would expect would be uh, a lot more engineering types. Right now, NSBE has this thing, 10,000 in 2025, you're familiar with that, right? And so I think that's a challenge that needs a lot more proactivity to get to that particular type. I think we need that. I, I know we need that. Uh, and I even I, I look around and look at my grandson as an example, as a person who I probably should, should be driving him a little more. He's only 13 years old. But, but he's probably an example, but there are a lot more examples. I'll give you a lot more examples in a minute of people who should be aware of the opportunities, youngsters that should be aware of the opportunities, and can be driven toward taking advantage of those opportunities in engineering fields. Okay, so my organization's on the west side of Chicago. If you're familiar with the west, I'm not, I didn't even ask you. Are you familiar with the west side? Or very right? abstractly. <laughs> okay, so 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 I I operate out of what I call the real west side of Chicago. Not and what do you what do you mean, Ed Coleman? What's the fake west side of Chicago? But the real west side of Chicago is the area that I believe an area that I believe can benefit from the kind of transformation that I talked about earlier. Part of that is is people in general and kids in particular not being exposed to opportunities. Educational opportunities, cultural opportunities, all kinds of opportunities. They just don't have the exposure that other people have in other parts of the United States and the Chicago area. So part of what I think is needed in order for NSBE to accomplish its vision, to achieve its vision, is as, as we strive toward the mission, doing the things that need to be done to expose people to opportunities that they may not be aware of. Your average kid in a Chicago public school system probably has very little of any concept. I'm even talking high schoolers very little of any concept of what an engineering person is or what an engineer is, very little, and, and probably has no idea that that's a career opportunity and a career opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. They just don't know. So I think part of what, and, and I've, by the way, I don't believe Chicago is alone in that. I think that's all over the United States. Uh, so part of what is really needed is is a more 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 proactive tactics, more proactive tactics to expose youth to the opportunities that exist that would have them strive toward that type of, uh, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I love it. I, I love the words. The, the words are still appropriate and they will continue to be appropriate. 
the achieving of that takes a collective effort and and that collective effort is not if it were easy anybody could do it it's kind of it's kind of it I, I guess it takes it takes a concerted collective effort to achieve what it is that, that's trying to happen you know you know Carl Reed right you know who he is yeah he 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 and I have had this discussion before so Carl Reed is the executive director he's the executive director of, of, of NSB yes so for yeah, the record, for the others listening. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. For those listening, Carl Reed is the executive director of the National Society of Black Engineers, mm -hmm. and so we've had uh, a few discussions on the ten thousand in twenty twenty five and, and so forth, uh, and and a lot of great words are being talked about, are being spread around. Uh, I participate in the Chicago professional chapter of NSB. I do participate. Uh, I'm not an officer, probably won't ever want to be an officer. Uh, at this stage of my life, I got too much other stuff going on, uh, but I do participate. And so getting youth exposed to things and, and part of what, so there's an engineer's week activity that I participated in. Part of that was exposing kids to the career areas. Uh, more of that is needed, and there are a lot of kids that, don't, for whatever reasons, don't get exposed to that. So we want to do more to expose kids. Mm -hmm. uh, other parts of the United States can probably, ought to be doing some of the similar things. And it's more than that, but that's one element of it, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Okay. okay. And while anyone can join NSB, the name and mission does reference black engineers. Yes, it does. So what does the term black engineer mean to you and for the organization? Uh, for to me, uh, a black engineer represents not only a highly skilled individual, but because this person is a black engineer, might have some unique, unique capabilities that a person who's an engineer who's not black would have. In other words, the the way that black engineer may have gotten to where that person is, to me, means that that person has overcome a lot. That person has, has experienced a lot of resiliency, has overcome a lot of challenges to get to where they are. That person is, is probably more than capable of, of solving some problems. And, and having grown up in a certain environment, may be able to even identify problems that other people may not be able to identify. So a black engineer is a very valuable individual in society, in, in my opinion. Okay. And um, in the Purdue archives, mm. they have some pictures <laughs> of uh, the torch, the Nesby yeah. torch symbol key. Yeah. Um, dedication, mm -hmm. and you're here with other founders as well, Absolutely. and other people. So could you tell me a little bit about um, that day, what that experience was like for you? It's memorable. I, you know, I can't tell you all the details except being, uh, having, uh, first looking at the key, I, I, I'm saying, wow, my name is here permanently. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm permanently ingrained at Purdue University. That's, that's really historic. Uh, I say I would say that okay. So a lot of what I think about in terms of of Nesby is me being in the right place at the right time. If somebody else been in my position, they probably would have been able to take advantage of the same thing that I was able to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. I happen to be there. I happen to be at Purdue when we were making Nesby happen, and so I feel good about the fact that collectively, we all the, those of us who are in the, those pictures have figured out that it makes sense to work as a team to make this stuff happen. And so, so this was a, a team approach, it really was, that, that uh, we all participated in and, and did something that is positive for society. By the way, I said, the, I said today even, we should probably call ourselves ISBE because it's an international organization. We have a Ghana chapter and a few, I think some in Canada and a few others. Uh, so, so we got we've impacted people all over the world, uh, and so this this the dedication of the key is kind of a symbol of what that impact is. Mm -hmm. 
It really is. It's a symbol uh, that is is there and will will remain there for who knows how long. Uh, and I think I think it's uh, it's a symbol of what can be accomplished if you're trying to accomplish something and the benefits of doing that. So you were student member, student leader, mm-hmm. and I know at some point now you're saying currently in the Chicago Professionals Realm. I, I went, what I, other ways has your, partici- your participation in SB changed over the years? So, so right out of college, I, I would say I didn't participate very actively at all. Okay. I would come back to Purdue or wherever else they wanted me to go, University of Illinois, to give a talk. Or, or maybe George and I, or George and John and I, or... Or Brian, you know, we, we would we might visit Purdue on occasion, but but it was just to try to encourage the that current group of students. Mm-hmm. I was not that active a participant right out of college because I was working on my career and working on my family and all those kinds of things, all those other things that that uh, one tends to get into when you're twenty something years old and trying to establish some things. Uh, but. Every few years, I would attend the national conference as the, nas- as the organization and the vitality of the organization became more and more obvious as it became a multi-thousand person organization. I was amazed, and, and I think it was a, a convention in Houston a few decades ago that really opened my eyes in terms of how substantial NSBE had become. Uh, it, that that shocked me in terms of all these people are here for for this organization. I mean that it, it was. I mean it was it, it was it was dramatic to me. Um, and was it dramatic just because of the sheer number of attendees, or what about it? Made yes. It yeah. Well, not only the sheer number of attendees, but the fact that if I if I fully believed that these attendees were participating in what we were trying to make happen as an organization, that this number of, of attendees were going to be real engineering people. They were going to be real engineers in their lives. And so, so what that told me in so many words was part of what I did as an individual and as, as part of what we did as a team was inspirational enough where we inspired a whole lot of people to get into this career field that may not have if we hadn't done what we had done. So that's that's kind of kind of it. I personally, uh, again, I was not a participant in the a strong participant in the day to day activities of Nesby right out of college. I got more and more involved. Let's see, as my family grew up. <laughs> and as my career evolved where I was able to prioritize things, and, and it's complicated, you know, as, as, as I became less and less interested in being the president and CEO of AT&T, uh, my priorities changed and, and, and my d- desire to have an impact on society in different ways changed and evolved. And so then, then so so then I got more involved in, in certain other things, and participated in more Nesby activities. I'd visit Purdue a little more often. I'd visit University of Illinois. I'd visit uh, Northern Illinois University. Uh, I actually visited Northwestern. They have a chapter, and so I I talked to them and inspired them and that type of thing. And um, and. My personal priorities became such that I thought that became more and more important. So then it was after then that that I decided that I'm going to spend more time with the professional chapter of uh, the Chicago professional chapter, mm-hmm. which is what I've been doing for the last few years. Okay. Yeah. And so looking over your personal and professional mm-hmm. life, would you say that Nesby has, a, has played a significant role in who you are today? I'd say so. In what way? In multiple ways. Um, one of the things Nesby has told me is that you never know when you do something I'm sorry it's hard to determine when you're involved in something what impact that's going to have on other people 
uh, hard to determine. I, I had no concept whatsoever of what being part of SBE, what impact that was going to have on anybody in Ghana. <laughs> I had no, no, no feeling whatsoever. Uh, that that we were going to create engineers, we were going to have people inspired to be engineers all over the world. That was not in the, 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 that was not even in the back of my brain at that, at that time. So, uh, so I, I guess that kind of answers the question that that it's hard to determine. Yeah, a, a lesson learned is is and, and I'm using this lesson as I do my day to day job with with Bethel New Life. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that having a positive impact on other people's lives should be the goal. So at Bethel New Life, we I do a lot of my team does a lot of entrepreneurship development and career training, giving people on the west side an opportunity to do something they didn't know was available to them. Is there a tr machine still working? Okay. So, give, so giving people an opportunity they, they didn't know was available to them. But that philosophy of exposing people to opportunities is some of what we've done with NSBE. So I'm just carrying it in a, I'm doing it in a different way mm -hmm. with what I'm doing with Bethel New Life, but it's, it's a similar similar uh, impact, if you know what I mean. All right. What advice would you give to a current Purdue Nesby student who's, you know, at the sort of the beginning of a Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so don't, don't take your eye off the ball. Don't get excited about all the flash that you see, like, like uh, you know, everybody making all this noise when they attend the national conferences. and Don't get excited about that stuff. Try, try not to let that distract you from, from really what you think you need to do to be successful. And, by the way, be successful. Uh, inspire the success of other people. It's okay to be successful. That's great. You want to be successful. If you can inspire the success of other people, your success is even more magnified. Mm -hmm. So that's what I tend to tell other students at Purdue that part of what we were trying to do there is really encourage and inspire the success of our peers and other people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that students get a little caught up in the I, I'm, I, I think I've seen it. And, I, and I, I, I don't double check on these students five years later and ask what you've been doing. Yeah. But, but I think my observation is, is yes, to some degree... To some degree, the the Hollywoodness of Nesby activities might overwhelm some people who get exposed to that, and so so I'm a little bit cautious, and it might come across as preachy when I try to confront students directly with that. You know, here's this old guy who's telling us that we shouldn't party or whatever. And I guess I'm not really saying that. And what I'm telling them is don't take your eye off the ball. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you keep your eye on the ball and do the things that you need to do to drive your own success. And, as important, drive the success of other people. Okay. Okay. And how do you think that Purdue, um, as a university, can contribute to... The success of black engineers and so you still have people like Virginia Booth doing the things that they need to do to, to help encourage students to to support them to support each other I guess uh, I think and I haven't been there in a while Purdue used to have this this uh, alumni center and they had I remember having big pictures of people like us. The founders, when you walk in the door of the Alumni Center, saying these were the founders of NSB and all that kind of stuff. But but you got Virginia, you got you got the key, uh, and you have the Black Cultural Center, which should also be helpful. Uh, but I think Purdue itself, and and those who know the legacy can continue to communicate that legacy to to new students. 
to, to students and the new students about why things are the way they are, why NSB was started, and why it's beneficial to participate in the organization because it'll help people be successful. So I think Purdue should should do that. Having the okay, so 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 okay. Mayor Mayor Rahm Emanuel of Chicago. I don't think he's visited Purdue yet, but he was going to, and I think I, they were asking me to participate in that visit. Uh, I think part Rahm was visiting all kinds of uh, t uh, engineering schools. I think to some degree to to uh, promote. Chicago students as potential enrollees at those schools. Um, and so uh, I think if Purdue is, I think Purdue is one of those schools. There's a complicated thing that I don't want to get into to too much detail on. But there are things like you have the City Colleges of Chicago, which is a community college based organization that's trying to do things to encourage, to prepare people to go beyond the city colleges into other academic areas once they complete, and one of them is engineering. Um, and, and so I know the chancellor of the city college as well. And so I think that a relationship between the city of Chicago, as an example, and Purdue to help uh, people from Chicago and, and the Chicago area with opportunities for career development in engineering is, I think the opportunity is there and, and it should be leveraged. That's an example of what Purdue can be doing to, to, to help with this. And from your perspective, mm -hmm. do you see um, any differences between students that participate in NSB and those that might not? Since I, I, I would think that most African American students, black students, should be inspired to participate in NSB, I have a hard time figuring out why those who don't wouldn't. Uh, and I, I can only speculate in terms of why that might be. Uh, it's my belief that if there are students, African American students that don't participate in NSB, they're they're missing something. It may not all be academic, but they're missing something. One of the things they I know they're missing is the ability to have a significant impa impact on other people. No matter you know if they're if they're getting straight A's, if they're getting straight A's in engineering. That means that they could help other people strive toward getting those straight A's. And if they're not participating in NSB, their opportunities to do that are lessened, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a definite, and, and by the way, that is, that is, that's a missed opportunity. And I think it costs uh, the institution if, if that's happening. It's just my belief. Okay. And one of the unique features of NSB um, is that it's been student-led um, yes. at all the different levels, so chapter, regional, and national level. Yes. Just thinking of where NSB has grown to this global organization, your mm -hmm. <laughs> international mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. of black engineers. Um, how do you think the role of that, the student-led component with the community of support that so, supports So community? part of what... Part of the real benefit of NSBE for many of the participants is they gain leadership skills that they can leverage even you know, well beyond when they leave NSBE into career, career development kinds of things. Uh, so, so having a national -led, nationally led, student led uh, organization provides much opportunity that I think the corporate world recognizes carries considerable value as they begin to look at at who they want to hire and what the opportunities are for people they want to hire. The resumes of NSB leaders 
has to really have to really be I'd say in general your typical Nesby leader has a resume that is extremely magnetic for many corporations that are looking at hiring people in roles that would lead to leadership positions. Okay, is that okay? And in what ways have your experiences at Purdue in general continued to shape who you are and what you do today? Purdue? Uh, uh, boy, that's a good question. That really is a good question. Um, I think Purdue was one of the best experiences I've ever had in terms of exposure for me to all kinds of things. Not only academic, but, but in general, other people. A wide variety of cultures. Uh, not only white people, but Asian people, Latino people. Uh, got a feel for, for things like that. Uh, I, that's where, of course, I, got, I gained a lot of my independence, learned how to live on my own for the most part. Um, learned how to deal in an environment totally different from Chicago. I mean, West Lafayette was West Lafayette, sleepy town to some degree. Um, um, dealing with the professors in general, I, I learned. I learned a lot about. Uh, human nature, a lot about authority and how to deal with authority. Um, and a lot about the benefit of being diligent and how that would benefit me. Being diligent and resilient. Okay. And is there anything else you would like to share about Nesby or your Purdue experience that we haven't discussed? Let me think about that. You build, you tend to build, uh, so I'll go back to SBE, you tend to build lifelong relationships. I have. I talked to a gentleman the other day who lives in Arizona was like a sophomore when I was a senior. So, you know, sometimes you wonder what's happened to people all these years, but you tend to build lifelong relationships. Uh, Nesby, SBE and Nesby were instrumental. Those relationships probably would not exist because there, there would be little reason for us to get together. There would be reason to get together, but it was easier to get together as a result of the organization. Uh, so, so those relationships continue. Uh, Art Bond, who I haven't talked about enough, uh, was very supportive of me coming into Purdue, and he was supportive of Nesby. And I'll talk more. But uh, Art was supportive of all the things I talked about. Uh, just about everything I talked about would not have happened without Art's support. Art was our faculty supporter person. And he was a graduate assistant staff at the time. Uh, working on his PhD. Right. Uh, yes. So, so he was. Yes. The, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he had his master's. I know he's working right. on his PhD at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Art was probably the first African. I think he was the first person, but definitely the first African American person I met on a summer visit before I even started school to Purdue. Uh, and as and we we were we were. Relatable. He had a lot of relatability. He's actually from the Chicago area, so we discussed. He's actually from the south suburbs of Chicago, so he was not. He wasn't far from Morgan Park High School, uh, where I went. So, so we could relate to that. And uh, he was very interested in. He he expressed a definitive uh, desire to support my success, and so I don't want to diminish anything regarding art at all. He was extremely instrumental. Uh, his name is on the Purdue key mm -hmm. for, for good reason, because it would not have happened. It's not just us six students, it was art 
It would not have happened without arts participation. Can you give an example of a situation in which he was really instrumental? I know there are many. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mentioned the the, the creation of the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the coordinating and organizing of the first conference. Uh, but just, just in general, I'd sit down with Art and talk about how I was doing in certain classes and how I had done in certain classes, and he'd give advice on, these are the classes you need to take next and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think he was the main guy who, who, I worked with to decide mechanical engineering was the the engineering uh, study choice versus any of the other engineering fields. Um, so he was he was a good counselor in general, a very a very good academic counselor, but a good counselor in general with respect to uh, making sure that uh, I was diligent. He made sure I was diligent in in achieving what I needed to achieve. So Art, Art was just good. He was just good. He participated in, in these SBE meetings and would give us guidance in terms of what we need to focus attention on and how we need to do it, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. Was there anything else? Mm -hmm. sure. Art had an assistant while I was, I think she was there until after I graduated. Her name was Sony Taylor. Uh, and she was helpful, especially as I started to get into my, my uh, job interview process in my senior year. She was helpful in terms of coordinating a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And was a good, good guide, gave me good guidance in terms of which companies I ought to be talking to and which ones are probably lower on the priority list, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'll give her all kinds of kudos also. Uh, I mentioned Fred Cooper, I mentioned Ed Barnett. There are probably a few others whose names I, I can't necessarily recall, but those were two key individuals, upperclassmen, who provided a lot of guidance. Um, that's about it. I can't think of anything else. Okay. Thank you. Well, I know there's, there's a lot of stuff out there, and we only have so much time, I guess. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and for me, you're going back, and for all of us, I guess you're going back 40-plus <laughs> years. So, yeah. yeah. Thank Absolutely. you for all your contributions well, thank you. and the, con the contributions that you helped start. <laughs> uh, we were, I was personally right place, right time, and, and did what I needed to do. But I'll say it again, I learned a lot of lessons from, from then that I still utilize today mm -hmm. in my current job and in other areas. Yeah. So. Absolutely. To have a significant impact on others. That's not the goal. <laughs> significant. That's it. That's it. Yep. So many words. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Tasha. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Time.